أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المبلومين ولعنة الله على أدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, welcome back to this, your show from the holy city of Karbala. We are on Back to the Basics, the show in which I, your host, Yahya Seymour, discuss some of, of course, the more apparent differences between us and others. And inshallah ta'ala, these discussions about these heavy and crucial differences are done in a way which is not only respectful of ourselves, but also respectful of those who believe in alternative views and views which we consider to be either deviated or deficient of the truth. Of course, one thing we'd all like to highlight is that human beings are in a constant search for truth, inshallah ta'ala, and we have to respect anyone that's open-minded enough to speak about the things that they believe. Anyone that does hold religious beliefs holds them very passionately and it's always great to be able to respect one another and that is of course why we've attempted to always throughout this discussion throughout this show demonstrate a lack of awareness in regards to what others present as their own beliefs and more importantly discuss the implications of those beliefs dear viewers we have of course rounded off our long exploration of the worldview that could be described as atheism now of course, I did discuss numerous times why we described atheism as a worldview, as opposed to merely the lack of a belief in a particular deity. And for those of you that wish to return to those episodes, you can. But of course, now that we have moved away from atheism, let us come back to a topic much lighter for tonight, in order that we might get to the substance of the continuation of atheism in the next few nights, inshallah ta'ala. We are, of course, broadcasting live from the holy city of Karbala. And so, as we would say in Arabic, la ba's, there is no problem in us taking from some of the wisdom of Imam al Hussein in describing the situation of human beings. And this is a topic which is very closely and intricately, intimately related. Intimately and intrinsically related to the topic that shall be guiding us for possibly the next night or two, inshallah ta'ala. When it comes to the solution to the problem that the worldview of atheism fills, we need to find an adequate solution. And of course, I have stated that one of the main responses that would be given to you by an atheist is to say, well, it could be any God. It doesn't need to be your God, and therefore you haven't won the discussion. Of course, it's a great appeal, and it's generally the approach of those who like to be argumentative to suggest that just because they haven't, just because they've proven you wrong, that their beliefs now become right. Now, of course, the problem with this is that we are discussing two opposing worldviews. There is no third worldview in the conversation. And if a discussion is genuinely occurring between an atheist and a Muslim or an atheist and a Christian, then what you expect to be compared are atheism and Christianity. Likewise, if the conversation is occurring between a 12 or Shia and a Sunni, then what you expect is a conversation between 12 or Shiism and Sunnism. Furthermore, if a conversation occurring is a conversation between a Salafi and a 12 or Shia, then you would likewise expect a conversation between a Salafi and a Twelver Shia. So those who make an appeal to a worldview that is not actually their own worldview in a conversation in order to win the conversation are merely those who have no leg to stand on. And what I mean by that is there are people who discuss in order to affect doubt. And they want to affect this doubt not because they are sincere in bringing you to that which they believe is true, namely their own belief system, but rather they're sincere in trying to make you doubt what you believe 
for no other reason than trying to make you doubt what you believe and win an argument against your belief system. And of course, this is not a very sincere way to go about things. We need to be sincere in stating that by taking a position in any particular issue, you have essentially become part of a conversation. And there's no point in hiding behind a fence and throwing, dare I say, stones and bricks and even grenades at the fortress of your opponent when you're not willing to even show your own position and discuss what your fortress is. And that's a massive problem we encounter with the atheists. So one of the main common responses we would get is, I could believe in four. And now the problem of objective morality, intelligent design, and so on and so forth are answered. Of course, the slightly more academic atheist will never, will never say that they believe in Thor. They'll never invoke uh, another one of the ancient demigods which were believed in by the ancient pantheons of world religions. Rather, what they would say is, that's fine, but it doesn't prove by any means, shape or form, the deity or the God that you espouse as the Abrahamic God. What they might offer as a relatively viable alternative is the God of Deism. And the God of Deism is a very attractive belief. Why? Because in Enlightenment Europe and post-Enlightenment Europe and even pre-Enlightenment Europe, but rather in the Europe which emerged after the Dark Ages, but particularly during the time of the Renaissance, the Renaissance, of course, for those of you who do not know what it is, you may refer to Google and you may refer to Wikipedia, but inshallah ta'ala you can refer to something slightly more academic and objective because those are not the best sources for anything. But nonetheless, they'll give you a very key and clear understanding of what they are to a very general level, inshallah ta'ala. For those who emerged after the Dark Ages and particularly during the Renaissance, one of the earliest places that a atheist or a free thinker could hide was not to outright doubt in God's existence, but rather to hide behind the guise of, I'm a deist. Or they could be what we called a pantheist. And of course, these two terms were quite synonymous in the history of European thought. What I mean by these two terms, I'll define them quite clearly, is a deist is someone that believes that there is a God who created the universe, but that this God does not reward or punish. He's essentially indifferent to us and we're indifferent to that God. What I mean by that is he's the God who created, but essentially after that creation has absolutely zero role and we have absolutely zero obligation to that God. So it allows for the existence of a God, but then the lack of a need to follow a religion. And a pantheist is someone that believes that the concept of the universe and God are ontologically inseparable. And of course, unfortunately, there are panentheists who exist within the ranks of the Muslim fold. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll get to them as well in discussing whether or not their beliefs are a sustainable worldview either, but now is not their time. For now, we're just discussing it. pantheists and deists. Pantheists, of course, claim that the universe is inseparable from God. So essentially, the entire cosmos is God. And what this leads to is a form of what we call monism, where they believe that everything is, has this oneness, this unity in existence. Now, the reason this was a popular hiding place for the atheist in post-Dark Age Enlightenment Europe was because you could continue to be someone who didn't have the outright blasphemy to declare there was no God. And so you wouldn't be put to death or burnt at a stake or essentially chastised and driven out and banished from society, for society held much stricter views back then. Rather, you could hide in the rabbit hole of claiming that I do believe in a God, but what I mean by that is he's inseparable from 
the natural world. And so what you'd find is these individuals who are pantheists, these individuals who are deists, it's an extra word they've added to a can, but in reality that can is no different from the can of naturalism, although now they have a creator to add to that can. <clears throat> now, of course, one of the things that we find in the words of the great Imam, may my life be ransomed for his, who sacrificed his soul and the souls of that brave caravan in order to sacrifice everything for Islam and to sacrifice for the revival and preservation of Allah religion. Imam al Hussein, the son of Imam Ali, the son of Abu Talib, may the peace and blessings of Allah be on all three of those individuals. Is that he addresses the Muslims in his words of wisdom and he states what? He states about Allah and about human beings the following. قال إمام الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام إن عفضل الفرائد أو جبها على الإنسان معرفة الرب والإكرار له بالعبودية. That the best of the obligations or the best of deeds rather, which has been obligated upon human beings, is an awareness or a cognizance of the Lord and a decision to worship Him. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam likewise states, Man araf Allah kamulat ma'rafatahu. Whoever knows Allah azza wa jal, his cognizance has been made complete. So Allah azza wa jal through the holy Imams has informed us that cognizance and awareness of him is of course a necessary obligation upon all human beings and the best of obligations after that is to choose to worship him and of course worshiping him is likewise a rational obligation. Dear viewers we're going to go for a very short break and when we come back we'll continue. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum dear viewers, thank you for enduring with that short break. Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam states in his very famous dua, the dua which is cited in the book Biharul Anwar by Alama Majlisi. He states, Ilahi, Taruddudi fil athar, yojib bu'd al mazar, mata ghibta hatta yakun ghayr kul mufhara lak. O oh Allah, O oh my Lord, in your signs there is symbols leading towards you. When have you ever been hidden so that others could be the ones that make you manifest? And what we understand from this is that the Imam is referring to different types of ma'rafa. The Imam is referring to different levels of cognizance. So these levels of cognizance, of course, we have discussed in the previous episodes pertaining to atheism, especially per pertaining to veneration. Man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbuhu. Aw a'arafakum bi rabbihi, a'arafakum bi... Alafu. A'arafakum bi nafsahi, a'arafakum bi rabbihi. That the one who is most cognizant of himself is most cognizant of his Lord or the one who is most aware of himself, is most aware of his Lord. And the one who knows his self, knows of his Lord as well. Imam al-Husayn, he states, Ilahi, amart bil ruju'i ila al-athar, farja'ni alayk 
بكسوة الأنوار وهداية الاستبصار حتى أرجع إليك منها كما دخلت عليك كما دخلت عليك منها مصون السر أن النظر عليها and Imam Hussain is of course referring to the fact that Allah Azawajal has commanded us to, con to contemplate on the signs of his creation. And in doing so, we would find that there is the solution to knowing that deism and pantheism are not viable solutions in terms of being alternative options to real theism and essentially a great get out of jail free card for the atheist who wants to play games on worldview discussions. And what I mean by that is that there is certainly there is certainly a tendency to discuss these things as if they are meaningless. The atheist might say to you that I believe in a God but it's the deist God. And essentially what the atheist is doing is playing a giant game. He does not believe in the deist God, nor does he believe in any other form of God. He says this in order to escape from the dilemma that having no God produces. So when it comes to the issue of objective morality, we've seen how atheism doesn't allow for that. So there's two, there's two options. You can either reject that morality exists and go down the rabbit hole with Alice in Wonderland and take the red pill and find yourself back in the matrix again. Or you can go nuclear as an atheist and say, well, yes, there is no such thing as objective morality and that's it. It's all subjective. But of course, no one lives their life in that way. So it's not a very nice thing to do. And so what might happen instead is the atheist who begs for a reason to believe in objective morality. And one way to do that might be to invoke the God that is the deist God. But the problem with that is, if the whole premise of deism is that there's a God who doesn't want us to worship him, that there's a God who has absolute indifference to this universe and a God who gives us no obligations, then it doesn't sound like the deist God possesses much explanatory scope in this discussion. And the reason for that is, if there's a God who is indifferent to me knowing of his existence, why would he endow me with the concept of morality, which of course is a great argument for his existence? Why would a God who doesn't want us to know of his existence plug in the qualities of fine-tuning into this universe, which again would allow me to make a great cosmological argument. A cosmological argument for those who are unaware is an argument which, of course, looks back at the fact that this universe has a beginning. Why would, of course, he allow me to have great constants which allow for a great teleological argument. And a teleological argument is of course an argument which makes appeal to the concept of design and the fact that this could not have just come about out of randomness. And of course, these are all things which we observe in the universe. These are things which belong to the realm of natural theology. What I mean by natural theology is there are things that the average man's mind can observe. Now, of course, if you want to argue that the coding in our DNA, which of course can house all the books in the world in a single teaspoon and have far more storage available for all the libraries in the world and every book written in every language, then you can liken this to just randomness. Then it's quite difficult to understand what is being said and this would really lead to a level of what I call cosmological skepticism. Not cosmological skepticism, cosmic skepticism rather. What do I mean by that? Let's take a look at the belief of the atheist once more. The atheist is willing to claim that the fine tuning, the constants, were all just random. They came about by randomness and it couldn't have been any other way. That's fine. Imagine a book 
came out of a lab filled with 15 monkeys typing away on keyboards arbitrarily and they produced the work Cleopatra by, not Cleopatra, rather they produced the work Macbeth by Shakespeare. When we look at the detail of the work, we would see that a clearly well-intentioned writer had written this play. But imagine we were to say that no, this came from that room of monkeys and therefore it doesn't matter if the probability is really, really low. Generation after generation, these monkeys were bashing away on keyboard randomly until this work came out. Yes, it might show signs of being in a coherent language. It might use metaphors and other similes and other functions which in the English language are clearly utilized by very intelligent and very craft and very capable craftsmen in their particular fields. But nonetheless, this is all a product of generic randomness emanating from this one room of monkeys typing away on a keyboard. Would anyone think we're rational? Absolutely not. And so what often happens here is the atheist might try and appeal to the deistic God as it means to say, yes, okay, we believe in a God now, but that still doesn't explain away. And it now explains away the problem of morality, explains away the problem of fine tuning. But does it really? Does it really explain away the objection of fine tuning or the objection of morality? If the deity we believe in or the deity that created this universe has given us about 50 reasons in these points I've discussed alone for us to come to know of his existence, if he is really the God who has given us the fitra that I discussed, that fitra which makes us afraid to challenge him, then what has better explanatory scope? Islam, Shia Islam in particular, which believes in the fitra and believes that we have been endowed with the ability to, in, to intelligize, him, to, rather, I'm looking for the word but it's not coming to me, it believes that we have been given the ability to recognize ration, uh, we've been given the ability to recognize morality as intelligible or a worldview that teaches that there's a God but he's not concerned with us whatsoever, it doesn't even want us to know him and yet has written a morality on our souls that we can all somehow perceive. Does it make any sense that the God who wants nothing to do with human beings has given them infinite ways to come to know of his existence. Of course, this is one of the reasons why many people cannot take the worldview of deism seriously. And deism is, of course, a worldview that you don't really find many subscribers to. Most people that were once deists have now become atheists and they've now become full-hearted naturalists and for a good reason. Dear viewers, thank you for tuning in once more. In the next few episodes, we'll continue discussing deism, pantheism, and the option of numerous generic gods as well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.